Hi everyone, meteorologist Steve Caparata here with another episode of Coast and Climate and this week we indeed are going to focus on the climate a bit. Now I think it's some news that's come out from the governor's office in the state that uh, maybe a lot of you still aren't aware of. So I thought I'd bring in a guest that can tell us a lot more about that news that I'm referring to today. This is Lindsay Cooper. Good morning to you. So you're the uh, manager of the governor's office climate initiative, correct? That's right, Steve. All right, so um, a few months ago, uh, we had this climate action plan come out. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what exactly it is? You don't have to, it's a long plan. But give us kind of a summary of what that is and how it was created. Sure, so I'll speak a little bit to the background in creating this plan. So the climate action plan is Louisiana's approach to reduce emissions and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So in Louisiana, we're very familiar with the impacts of a changing climate. We live in a very dynamic, deltaic system. And as we've seen over the past years, we not only are experiencing sea level rise, which is very well addressed in our coastal program and the impacts of coastal erosion, but we're also seeing extreme heat increase and affect some of our industries as well as our communities alongside increased severity and frequency of storms and hurricanes. And with that, this governor has realized back in 2019 that we can't just adapt our way out of the climate crisis. We need to be proactive and mitigate the risks that we have. So that gave birth to this climate initiative. And in the governor's second term in 2020, he wrote an executive order that established emission reduction goals, and we'll get to that, mm -hmm. and set up a task force to develop an action plan called our Climate Action Plan, what we're going to talk about today. Right. And that's going to put us on a pathway to meet those goals. So that's the birth and the genesis of the action plan, building on the foundation of a lot of work already going on in the state. So you mentioned the task force there. Tell us a little bit about the task force, how it was created, who it's comprised of, and um, so they've created this plan. I'm asking, it's kind of a multi-part question. So how was that created, and, and what is their job going forward now? Mm -hmm. That's a great, great multiple questions right there. So the task force was created in the executive order. It's a 23-member public body that was in charge of creating the climate action plan. And it allowed for us to have a lot of public transparency in the process and engagement as well in this task force. So it brought together not only state agencies, but also members from industry, non-governmental organizations, um, environmental advocacy groups, our academics. So we really brought together all the stakeholders that have a vested interest in climate, who have a lot of different perspectives to bring to the table. And our work as the governor's office chairing the task force, we also manage development of the action plan. So we would bring everyone's ideas together and then basically spit back out to the task force um, recommendations, which we iterated on, of how we would reduce our climate emissions with them. So moving forward, the climate task force continues to meet. We meet quarterly now instead of two or three times a month, mm -hmm. which I know they're all happy about. Um, but they are now more an oversight body of implementing the action plan as well as catalysts in their communities and their networks for action as well. So the key goal here established by the governor and, and uh, kind of what was passed on this task force is, is net zero emissions, right, by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, so, so tell us about those goals. So that, that's 2050, but this is kind of an iterative uh, process. So, so what are the goals going forward from where we are right now in 2022? Right, so we have this eventual goal of net zero by 2050. And net zero can be a bit of a tricky term. And that, it really means the to sum total of our greenhouse gas emissions in Louisiana. So it's our carbon sources as well as our carbon sinks. When we think of sources, think industry, passenger vehicles, buildings, put out a lot of emissions. Sinks is more geared towards our natural lands that can sequester carbon. So that goal of net zero is really the sum total of our sources and our sinks. But alongside that eventual goal of net zero by 2050, we have a goal of 26% reduction in emissions by 2025, and then 50% reduction by 2030. And that will help get us on the right path to reach net zero by 2050. 
From what I read in the report, the, that initial goal, 26% 2025, maybe a little ambitious, right? Right. right. That's gonna, and, and that's partially because this, this plan's just coming out, and so there's a short amount of time to kind of hit that initial goal, right? Right. Uh, but here in Louisiana, as you read through the report, one of the things that you'll, you'll find uh, mentioned several times is that as we aim to reduce emissions, we have sort of a unique challenge compared to maybe the rest of the country when it terms and where our emissions come from. Can you explain a little bit about that? Absolutely. In Louisiana, we have the supermajority of our emissions, so that's about two thirds of our emissions from the industrial sector, as opposed to na nationwide, and as we see in many other states that are addressing climate action, their emissions are predominantly in transportation and in the power sector. So Louisiana had, in developing the plan and now in implementation, we have a really unique position in working to abate the emissions from the industrial sector. And those are often known as the hardest to abate emissions as well. So it's a, a way for Louisiana to become a leader in a sector where there hasn't been a lot of leadership in reducing emissions. So you say the hardest to abate. Not only that, industry is such a key part of our economy. Uh, employ so many people in the state. So, so how do we how do we balance those two? We don't want to run industry out of the state, but how how do we keep that going but reduce emissions? In our plan, we put forward a lot of different mechanisms that can help in reducing and transitioning the industrial sector emissions, as well as building a strong workforce and economy. So, in the plan, we're not just setting that we have to reduce emissions by this date or else. A lot of fear around the energy transition is that it would happen overnight or it could displace a lot of jobs. The approach that we're taking is the long haul. So we want to put in place mechanisms that can increase our energy sources now and begin that transition without sacrificing the jobs that we have now. So it's, it's a long-term approach and in the plan we lay out regulations, incentives, economic opportunity is we even put forward recommendations on K through 12 education and on university collaboration around climate research. Because we see it's gonna take everyone coming to the table, not just a finger point in a specific industry or sector. So we've seen some industry, our, some of our industries, key industries here in Louisiana already kind of undergoing a transition in recent years is, is maybe it's a little more of a push to renewables. Um, we, we've seen some big refinery closures here in Louisiana, right? Um, I, I think part of this plan would be ultimately as we, we go to more renewables, that could mean that some of those industries would take a hit. But back to your point, I think the idea is maybe eventually, gradually through time, if we lose jobs on that front, that you're creating new jobs elsewhere. And we're creating the appropriate and opportunities to become technicians in other fields and in renewables. So we're not just leaving those jobs and losing jobs, but we're transitioning to a new sector so that our workforce can still work. It just might look a little different in energy. One other thing that uh, arises in the report, I think it's the LSU Center for Energy Studies, mm -hmm. is that right? So they, they have uh, done this audit of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Louisiana. And what I was kind of surprised by were the emissions here in the state were essentially kind of flat from 2005, the previous time they'd done it, to when they updated based on 2018 data, right? Mm -hmm. Can you explain how that could be? It seems like everything people hear is that greenhouse gas emissions are going up in most areas through time. So what's going on with that? Well, again, with such a unique industrial profile in Louisiana, we've increased production a lot. I'm, I'm sure as you've seen over the past, um, over a decade since 2005, that baseline that we set. But we've become a lot more efficient in the industrial processes that we have. So they're reducing less emissions. We have more... Um, energy efficient buildings and building components such as HVAC systems that are a huge contributor of emissions in the industrial space. But now that we've been able to reduce and provide some efficiency measures, the emissions have decreased across industry, but we've amped up production. So that's how it's kind of stayed level over time. How difficult is it to actually, get, you know, I know you didn't do the study for the LSU Center for Energy Studies, but still, even to me, it seems um, pretty amazing that we can get a decent estimate on 
those greenhouse gas emissions. How difficult is it to put a number on that? It's very challenging, and I am no economist. I will say that very clearly. Um, but working closely with LSU in developing this inventory, it, we use what's called the EPA State Inventory Tool. So we call it the SIT. And through the SIT, they provide, through EPA, they provide modules in each of the emission sectors that we're then able to use formulas to determine what our emissions are. So for example, in the industrial sector, we have a lot of self-reported data that can give us a bit more concrete information in our emissions. Uh, but if we're looking at methane or transportation, we can only provide estimates of what our total emissions are. So EPA provides these formulas that is the intention is to make our assessments even across all the states. Um, and then we kind of plug in the information we have. So it is just a snapshot in time. It's not continuous mm -hmm. data. And the other limitation is that it's estimations too. But it can give us a good idea of where our emissions are. So one thing about climate change in Louisiana is that's tied in very closely with our coast. We know a big part of climate change is sea level rise. Uh, here in Louisiana, we have a separate issue with our coast is subsiding through time. So uh, several years back, we came out with a coastal master plan, all these projects that, um, uh, that we're trying to do to, to take care of our coast. Is this plan linked to that coastal master plan at all? Uh, do they kind of jibe and work together as we go forward? That is a great question, and I'd say absolutely. There are key differences. The action plan is focused on mitigation, and the coastal master plan is focused on rebuilding our coast and protecting our communities from increased flood events. So there's a different focus there, but they're certainly complementary. And we have built on a lot of the foundation, as I mentioned, from the coastal master plan. Actually, both efforts are from the coastal office inside the governor's office. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of alignment and collaboration on how we've developed both plans and iterated on them through the years. I would call out specifically, there's a section in the action plan on natural working lands and wetlands. And in there, we point directly to implementation of the coastal master plan. That that is a key in, as I mentioned, those carbon sinks in storing some of CO2 naturally in our wetlands. That's done exactly through the work of the master plan. And just to kind of hammer home that connection, we had Chip Klein on here in a previous episode of this podcast representing CPRA, the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, but he also chairs the Climate Initiatives Task Force, right? So he's heavily involved on, on both sides of this for sure. So um, as we look at our coasts, the estimates are we've lost something like 2,000 miles of coastline since the 1930s might lose an additional two to 4,000 square miles over uh, the next 50 years, I think it is, or through 2050. Actions within this climate action plan, do, do, do those help with that at all? Or, or is it kind of that separation that you were just talking about? Both, it's a both and. So there is a, a bit of separation. Um, we're, the global emissions are a, exactly that, a global problem that sure. we're dealing with. And, uh, minimizing particularly sea level rise is related to the coastal program is going to be a global effort. But in this action plan, we put forward mechanisms that would incentivize further implementation of the coastal master plan. So for example, finding a way to market the wetlands that we have as a credit type system mm -hmm. that could rebuild our wetlands, sequester CO2, provide flood risk reduction, provide a whole host of benefits through our wetlands. So we see that as a key on both fronts uh, to move towards action. Okay, um, so the next thing I want to ask you about, as you make your way down this report, um, there's a section that uh, has these three key pillars. Can you tell us a little bit about those key pillars and what they are? Absolutely. So from our GHG inventory, our greenhouse gas inventory, we developed a net zero pathway for Louisiana. And in that, in developing our pathway of how we get to net zero by 2050, there are three key policy areas that we have to implement rapidly and quickly and um, over the course of the entire duration of the next 25 years in the Climate Action Plan. And those are all circling around 
energy and industry. Mm -hmm. So the first of those pillars is renewable electricity generation. So increasing the deployment of renewables in Louisiana. The second is electrifying industry. So once we've provided that renewable energy, basically plugging industry into those renewables so they're powered on renewables. And the third component is industrial fuel switching to low and no carbon hydrogen. And hydrogen is just one of the feedstocks, one of the fuels for industry. And if we can decarbonize that, that decarbonizes a lot of the industrial process. So those are our three main pillars, again, all centered around industry and power. And one of the things with the industry is right now when you talk about uh, you know, kind of making that transition, they burn a lot of fossil fuels in day-to-day -day operations. So where does Louisiana stand as a whole when it comes to uh, renewable energy generation here in the state? Mm. We fall very behind as it is now. We have about 2% of our total energy mix is from renewables right now. But we are rapidly increasing that every day. Mm -hmm. Through our public service commission that's approving more renewable development. I just got back from an offshore wind trip. We're looking at deployment of offshore wind, working closely with the federal government. So though we are small right now, we have big plans of increasing that generation. Yeah, I was going to say, so you mentioned offshore, as you, as you read through the report, mentions the, the offshore wind potential, solar potential, too, here in the state, right? There's a couple of big things right. we need to look into. Um, so earlier, you also mentioned something that might have gone past some people, carbon sinks. What are carbon sinks? What are, actually are those, and why are they so important as we look to uh, reduce our emissions or hit that net zero goal? That is a great question. Louisiana is uniquely positioned with the carbon sinks that we do have compared to many other states. So I'll explain what carbon sinks are a little bit and then dive into the different opportunities we have. So a carbon sink is our ability to either naturally or through an engineered approach store carbon in our environment. So instead of releasing out emissions, where we can store it either naturally through our wetlands and through our agriculture and forestry working lands if they're sustainably managed um, or bioengineered through carbon capture and storage and louisiana is uniquely positioned on both fronts right because we have all these wetlands which are huge sinks for carbon and we also have a robust forestry practice as well in our agricultural lands to we're a very ag-centered state so on that the realm of natural sinks, we have an incredible advantage. And then with carbon capture and storage, which is the bioengineering technique, we have these saline formations underground that provide an opportunity for Louisiana to store carbon underground as well, to geologically sequester it. Yeah, so let's talk about that. That's been, there have been a few big announcements here in recent months about these carbon capture projects here in the state including one that uh, says it'll be the, the, the biggest in the world, right, in Ascension Parish. So how exactly do those work? You, you mentioned saline. So we're talking about salt domes as, as kind of housing some of this, I assume? Right, right. That's a great question. So carbon capture, sequestration and storage. So it's CCS is how it's, it's short name, I guess. So there are three different components. Capturing the carbon, which happens at the industrial site, so instead of releasing carbon back to the atmosphere, industry through great technological advancements can actually capture that carbon and then compress it to a really dense form, transport it through pipelines, and then pump it underground into what you mentioned, those deep saline aquifers, which are a prime location for storing CO2 over the long term. It has a lot of potential over the long term. And these are deep storage sites as well. Mm -hmm. um, where do we stand? Are those projects or any of them actually underway yet? Or, or are those still down the road a little bit? Still down the road a little bit. Many in the front end engineering and design studies. Um, but there have been a lot of announcements. I believe 10 announcements since the end of 2019 around carbon capture projects. So there's a lot of interest in existing industry here. And as you mentioned, in industries coming here specifically for that potential. So as you read up on carbon capture, there are some people that say it, 
they're a little skeptical of it because it, it's still in its infancy as, as sort of a technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, do we know how effective this truly is and, and whether it's truly safe, that there's not um, a lot of leakage, if you will, in these projects? There is, and that's a question that we have received and want to work through a lot in our, in our climate initiative and with our agencies as well. So there are concerns around the deployment of carbon capture, and it's as in our task force we had some NGO and environmental advocacy voices that expressed that clearly. And the way that we are trying to strike the balance is providing updates to and aligning sort of our permitting and siting practices to provide the least amount of environmental damage is where we see that opportunity to, to work with communities but also not to thwart future investments as well. So it's it's a compromise on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of, it, just in addition to some of the ambition we have on the state side, there's a very thorough permitting process that any project would go through with EPA and then with the state where our agencies are assessed of their capacity to manage and assess these projects. EPA performs that assessment. There's it's years of a process to just permit and get the site development. So there is a very stringent process of how we get there that provides a lot of backstops that can address these questions we have and provide opportunities to continue working on this together. It's not a one and done. We haven't cited and developed them yet. It's, it's going to be a process, and there's a lot of potential for engagement in that as well as um, collaboration. You. Sure. And as you read about some of the carbon capture in this report, another phrase that comes up, I'd like for you to explain if you could, blue hydrogen. Can you explain that a little bit? Right. Right. So there are colors of hydrogen. Um, as I mentioned on our policy pillars, one of those is industrial fuel switching to hydrogen because hydrogen can be a very clean process and a very clean fuel for many of our heavy industrial practices. We have a lot of chemicals in Louisiana petrochemicals as well. Um, so blue hydrogen is the practice of using hydrogen and the emissions that are produced because splitting hydrogen molecules takes a lot of energy. The emissions that are produced are then stored underground in carbon capture and storage. And then if we take the green version of that, because there's also a green hydrogen, green hydrogen means that there aren't emissions in the process. Mm -hmm. There you could use, let's say, wind or solar to power the process instead of carbon capture and storage. Okay, that's a good explanation. Thanks yeah. for that, I appreciate that. So let's loop back to the beginning here. This is all about a, a pathway to net zero by 2050. So in the report, people will see this graphic. I'm gonna bring it up. It's probably a little complicated for the mm -hmm. folks at home looking at it right now, but can you give us kind of a, a quick summary of what we're looking at on that graphic? Absolutely. I'll start at the top. And believe it or not, this is a, a very simplified version. I know it's hard to take these complex topics and break them right. down. The top gray line shows Louisiana's projected emissions as we move into the future. As you can see, our emissions have potential to increase over 150 million metric tons mm -hmm. per year in emissions if we don't take action on climate. So not only are we facing this very high baseline of emissions, we also have that huge gray line of potential emissions Louisiana has. As I pointed out earlier, the top three blue lines in this graphic are centered around renewable energy and electrification of the industrial sector. So those are the what we've called our climate policy pillars, where we focus a lot of our recommendations around in the action plan. And then you get to some of the smaller slivers that you see, and those are um, with carbon capture and then our methane uh, policies as well and some of our other industrial policies like efficiency standards. So the, the majority, that huge chunk, including the yellow and the red line, are contributed to our industrial and our power sectors, how we envision abating emissions in those sectors. And then the smaller lines as we work down are our buildings, our built environments, um, our cars, our forestry policies. And then you see at the bottom this shaded line. There are two shaded lines actually at the bottom because we didn't have the ability and the tool that we were using to model some of the policies that we see Louisiana mm -hmm. can adopt. 
for example, a carbon, a price on carbon type mechanism. And there wasn't an accurate accounting of Louisiana's wetland sinks in the tool either. So we wanted to show that that's a big opportunity to abate emissions in Louisiana as well. Like we talked about storing those emissions. Um, so that's how we've laid out the graphic. Again, we, we do have graphics for each of the sectors. Um, but this provides our overall picture for Louisiana. Sure. And just to be clear as you look at this, so the solid black line is called business as usual. So this is kind of the best estimate of where we'd be in emissions if nothing changed. And the gray is kind of your uncertainty, right? Could go higher, a little bit lower. But the goal is to bring it down here by 2050. So um, I, I think it's really interesting. If everybody goes and pulls up the report online, maybe can be a little easier to read, take a few minutes and get a look at how it all works. Speaking of that report online, we can find that online. Tell them how they can find this. We have a web page on the governor's website. So it's gov.louisiana.gov, and then it's a backslash Climate Initiatives Task Force. And on that website, as shown here, we have the full climate action plan. It's about 180 pages. So I would encourage you to reference the executive summary, which is only four pages and it has a lot of pretty graphics on it. But also on that website, we have information on our executive order, all of our membership laid out, our mission, our vision. Um, a lot of our work that went into developing the action plan, we had incredible engagement from the public and over 150 stakeholders just directly engaged in developing the plan so that we wanted to find a way to archive all the input that they had in this process and maintain that transparency even in implementation. So the website has the plan, but a lot more. So I'd encourage you all to, to go there. Sounds great. So you brought in paper copies for me today, but so start for many people, probably start with the executive summary. That's kind of the Cliff's notes, right? And then if you really want to get into it, you can read the full report, which I did. And um, it's very informative. So check it out if you can. Before I let you go, I gotta put you on the spot here with one last question. So climate change, it can still be a controversial topic. Nothing, uh, no breaking news there, right? So what would you say to people uh, here in Louisiana that are, are still skeptical of climate change or what it might do to our state? That's a great question. As we, I have two, two thoughts come to mind. So the first is as we approach the coastal master plan with an understanding and a shared experience of coastal land loss in Louisiana, we can come to climate action in the same way. We have a shared experience that we're under heat advisories, what, for a week straight? Right. And it's only June. Right. And the, as we saw in the past two hurricane season, there is just an increased amount of these intensifying storms at the last minute that we haven't seen. And we saw it at previous times earlier this year, these torrential thunderstorms. And I believe that we all are starting to see the impacts as an area that is very much on the front lines of a changing climate. And we can all gather around the need for action there. Whether we might disagree over the cause of climate change, we can all see these impacts happening. So I see that's a, a great point for us to rally around. And the other is just around the economic opportunity. There's so much economic opportunity in the renewable space and in energy transition. It's where the global markets are shifting. It's where the federal administration is shifting. And Louisiana, the, through the governor's work, we're just jumping on board with all that momentum. So there's that economic argument and the shared experience as well that I think we can all agree on. And something that's uh, it's going to impact all of us. It's going to impact our children, our grandchildren, many ge generations to come. So a very important topic, no doubt about it. From my perspective, personally, I, I don't talk probably about climate change a lot or enough. Um, I, I don't like to get into the cataclysmic scenarios because I, I do think uh, that that can kind of scare people into inaction. Um, I think it's important to understand we, we can make a difference. And um, a lot of those worst case scenarios are just that. In reality, the truth is probably somewhere in between, but it's a very important topic and very important here in Louisiana where we're so vulnerable to weather and climate and how things are changing right now. 
Lindsay Cooper, thank you so much for coming in. This has been outstanding. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Again, so go check out uh, that plan online if you'd like to see a copy. And uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll be back next Thursday at 10 o'clock with a new episode. And you can catch all of our past episodes on WAFB Plus on our website and on YouTube as well. See you next Thursday at 10 o'clock.